Good evening. So I call this meeting to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Thomas, roll call, please. Dr. Bellamy. Ms. Hill. Here. Ms. Walker. Present. Mr. Signer. Here. Ms. Galvin. Here. Are there any announcements? I have a couple quick ones. The Charlottesville Sister Cities Commission Grant Program is currently accepting applications. Grants will be awarded for a wide variety of activities that promote the mission of the S Sister Cities Commission. Grants may range in size up to $4,000. Fundraising is eligible. Funds must be used within one year of receipt and expenditures must be detailed in the year-end report made to the CSCC. For the 2019-20 grant application, please email cvillesistercities at gmail.com. Again, Seville, C-V-I-L-L-E, sistercities at gmail.com. And one more. In addition to the Civilian Review Board, appointments will be considered for the following boards and commissions at the December 16th, 2019 City Council meeting. Applications are being accepted through December 11th for the Measurements and Solutions Group and the Ridge Street Priority Neighborhood Task Force. For more information on each of these groups, please visit the City website. Click on Departments and Services and Boards and Commissions. Mayor Walker, I have one. Uh, there will be a community meeting uh, for the Community Forest Management Plan, a new 142-acre parkland on Wednesday, November 20th, 2019, 4 p.m., the Water Street Center. That's where the TJPDC offices are. The USDA provided major funding for the city's recent acquisition of 142 acres of forested, forested land adjacent to Ragged Mountain Reservoir. To fulfill the grant obligations, a community forest plan must be developed and submitted to the USDA by January 2020. The city and Department of Forestry will share information about the land, describe what is involved in a community forest plan, and take input on the plan development. Some items to be included are potential trail alignments, plans for preserving, interpreting, and showcasing the qualities of the forest, and proposals for utilizing the land as an educational tool for local school students of all ages. The draft plan submitted with the grant application can be found at www.charlottesville.org slash parks and rec, all one word, under quote unquote events. The contact person on this is Chris Jenzik, trails. It's, his number is 434-970-3656, and his email address is jenzik, G-E-N-S-I-C, at charlottesville.org. Okay. Any other announcements? I have one, Mayor Walker. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Is it a funeral or a city the council evening. meeting? It's the rain? All right. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. Hopefully, we got some cheer. Uh, thanks to everybody who came out this weekend to the Run These Streets 5K. It was a lot of fun. Able to raise some funds for the upcoming event this excuse me this Sunday. Hope to see everybody at the Weco 2 Turkey Giveaway, the sixth annual event in which we will look to provide over 200 turkeys to families in need. Um, if anyone is in need of a turkey, anyone listening, please come out to the Jefferson School. That'll be this Sunday, the 24th at 2 p.m. at the Jefferson School African American Heritage Center. Uh, early arrival was suggested for those who have been the past few years. Um, unfortunately, there is normally a very long line and we normally run out of turkeys. I wish, that we, I wish that we didn't have to give away so many turkeys, but there is indeed a need in the city, in the area as a whole. So we're also still accepting donations. You can look online, PayPal, uh, we call two. Or please feel free to bring a turkey on Sunday, um, probably be there around 12.30 or 1 o'clock. If you have a turkey that you like to donate, please feel free to bring one or maybe 10. You're going to bring 10? 
All right, maybe. So, uh, again, we're accepting turkeys. We're trying to give away at least 200 turkeys. There will be people there who need them. And if you need a turkey also, come on out. We'll see you Sunday at 2 o'clock at the Jefferson School. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Hill. I, it says a motion I'm making. Um, I move that the following be appointed to our boards and commissions. The Board of Architectural Review, Ronald Bailey, Sonia Langell, Anderson McClure, and James Ziemer. The Community Development Block Grant Task Force, Emily Cohn Miller, Matthew Gillikin, and Helen Kimball. The House Housing Advisory Committee, Michael Cusano. Cusano. The Parking Advisory Panel, Michael Cusano. The Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Anne Hemingway, Edmund Mickey, Jennifer Slack, and Sean Strubble, or Strube, excuse me. The Personnel Appeals Board, Robert Woodside. The Retirement Commission, David Swanson and Franklin Henderson. The Sister City Commission, Neely Minton. The Tree Commission, Tim Pad Padalino and Roseanne Simon. The Vendor Appeals Board, Brian Hurst, and the Youth Council, John Kingdon. Second. Okay. Please vote. That carries five to zero. Um, next, we have the consent agenda. Ms. Thomas, would you read the consent agenda, please? A, minutes, September 19, September 30th, September October 7, 2019 special meetings. B, appropriation, Virginia Behavioral Health Docket Grant, $45,000, second reading. C, appropriation, Virginia Outdoors Foundation Grant, land acquisition, $50,000, first of two readings. D, appropriation, Virginia Department of Education Special Nutrition Program, Child and Adult Care Food Program, $35,000, first of two readings. E, appropriation, Virginia Department of Social Services Employment Advancement for Temporary Aid to Needy Families Participant Grant, $130,259.83, first of two readings. F, appropriation, fire apparatus payment reimbursement, $642,609, first of two readings. G, resolution, the Lua Project, Day of the Dead funding request, $500, one reading. H, resolution, referring New Hill Development Corporation's Star Hill Neighborhood Community Vision and Small Area Plan to the Planning Commission for consideration of amending the Charlottesville Comprehensive Plan. One reading. I, report, Charlottesville Albemarle Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, SPCA, report. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anyone from the public who would like to speak on the, any item on the consent agenda? No, all right. Um, my only comment before, uh, um, well first, is there a motion? I move that we adopt the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay, and uh, my only comment, comment is that we did receive an email from Mr. Fogel on the 15th and um, there was a link in there that originally the, I think it was Arlington, mm -hmm. um, Arlington um, County um, removed the requirement that defendants plead guilty um, before um, being involved in the um, mental health docket. And I would just like to just put on record that I would like for us to um, work with our um, staff and partners on attempting to remove that. Great. Any other comments or question? Oh. All right, please vote. All right. Carries five to zero. 
Um, next, we have the um, city manager's response to community matters from the previous meeting. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Member of City Council, and the public. I only have uh, two items tonight. Uh, one was dealing with the comment that was made at, last, at the end of our last meeting, and it was pertaining to uh, Mr. Stolzberg's, con Stolzenberg's comment uh, pertaining to funding the uh, tree study for the downtown mall. Um, he didn't understand why it was carried over and it cost so much for to do the tree study. And I think it was done in a proper way in terms of not overextending the budget in one fiscal year and carrying that money over to another fiscal year to be able to uh, complete a thorough study. Um, and it was basically to look at uh, tree uh, preservation uh, so that we could have a structured and a sustainability plan. And that was basically to ensure that the uh, survivability and long-term health of uh, trees uh, on our uh, downtown mall. And uh, especially uh, today when uh, the installation of trees has gone from $250 uh, a couple years ago to approximately $333 uh, dollars, uh, last year. Um, so for reference, uh, I'd just like to say with the Tree Commission, uh, they have a goal to plant about 200 trees annually. Uh, so that $88 difference uh, can drastically reduce uh, the number of uh, trees being planted uh, on an annual basis. And uh, that's based upon the dollars uh, that we put in the budget uh, every year. I know previously we put in there last year $50,000, and in 21 we do have in there proposed for $75,000. So uh, <coughs> what we want to do is just make sure that you know our trees are in good condition and that we're maintaining them, because if we lose one, that will impact the amount of trees that we have to plant. And I want to make sure that we do have uh, plenty of uh, trees uh, being planted throughout our community with the money that has been uh, adopted through the budget. And the last item uh, came from Miss um, Parker uh, pertaining to a camera that was on a pole near 8th and Hardy. Uh, that was one of our uh, uh, cameras. Uh, what we do, we move those periodically throughout the city based upon uh, requests from uh, different, uh, uh, different residents and uh, different community groups uh, that do uh, request uh, cameras in certain areas for a certain period of time. And that concludes uh, my uh, uh, comments uh, for tonight, uh, Madam Mayor. So there are cameras that are moved around the city? Yeah. Periodically, based upon certain things that are going on or requests from uh, different residents. And we don't, so, go ahead. So that was a resident request? To that, was a, that was a group request, yes. Yes. So I think, um, Dr. Richardson, just in, in regards to that, while I understand, I think it's, it's tricky and it's a slippery slope of sorts because there are some individuals who believe that their neighborhoods will be surveyed or have extra surveillance opposed to others. And then with there, with there being no notification, I mean, I can only imagine what the feedback would be if random cameras popped up on Park Street. Well, they do or have, in court. yeah, and they do have them in certain areas. And I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's not unusual. I mean, uh -huh. you know, if they request them, then uh, we'll place them there. Um, but you know, it's it's just because of you know certain things that go on in certain areas. So it's not one of those things. Since it's police, uh -huh. uh, you know, we can't say where they're going. Mm -hmm. So citizens can request that cameras are put up. And they can, they can make the request or basically uh, uh, by us with our uh, statistics. Uh, and we want to do surveillance in certain areas. Oh yeah, we need to discuss. That's fine. <laughs> this <a little> more. <laughs> yeah, Agreed. I don't know. That sounds really interesting. To say the least. But I'm just answering the question coming from the last meeting. No, that I'm she, still... right. You know. Mm -hmm. All right. Did you all? Well, I, I would like there? to formally request in that regard, Mayor Walker, if mm -hmm. there could be a, a, I don't know if we would need a, a formal presentation, but some okay. kind of. Um, report to council in regards to why well, I mean we were never notified or at least I can't speak for the rest of council but I was never notified that this would be a policy of source and I think for transparency and just for the public's uh, information this needs to be known that this is occurring in some regard and I can understand the safety perspective but just I mean I know where I live it, it would be I, I would be rather appalled if I just came outside one day and there was a camera there for whatever reason that's fine we can do that Okay. I agree. Hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And Mayor Walker, if I may, before we um, take on the community matters, I'd like to make a motion that we just read out loud the resolution that was passed on Friday mm -hmm. directing staff to prepare a removal of the statue lake located on West Main Street depicting Sacagawea, Meriwether Lewis, and William Clark. Okay. Okay. Um, please vote. Okay. All right. Are you prepared to read? Sure. It? Okay. So thank you, Mayor, Mayor Walker and colleagues. Uh, again, just as, as Councilor Bellamy said, for the sake of transparency I, and so the, the public to hear, this is the resolution directing staff to prepare removal of the statue located on West Main Street depicting Sacagawea, Meriwether Lewis, and William Clark. Whereas the Shawsville City Council convened a work session on November 15, 2019 to discuss the statue depicting Sacagawea, Meriwether Lewis, and William Clark located on West Main Street in the city of Shawsville, Virginia, and whereas the Shawsville City Council received input on the statue from representatives of the Shoshone and Monacan tribes, including lineal descendants of Sacagawea, and whereas the lineal descendants of Sacagawea, Sacagawea expressed their extreme displeasure with the depiction of Sacagawea and the statue located on West Main Street, now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the City of Shawsville, Virginia, that staff is directed to present the Council with a plan for the removal of the statue from West Main Street and such plan shall include a cost estimate for the removal of the statue, as well as options for the disposal of the statue, and be it further resolved by the Council of the City of Shawsville that staff is directed to present a plan to the Council of a new statue of Sacagawea and other memorializations of Virginia Native people with primary cons consultation from indigenous people on the design of the statue and other memorializations of Virginia Native people. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments? All I would like to add, Mayor, is that um, there will be a, the plan and then the appropriation will be coming to Council and then that will be on a posted agenda item as I understand it. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. And that entire meeting is um, on the website? Yeah. Charlottesville. Uh, Charlottesville.org slash streaming or the city's Facebook page. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have um, community matters. Oh, we're rolling right along. Um, first up, we have um, Bruce Eighties. Good evening, Madam Mayor. Good evening. Good evening, members of the City Council. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, I would like to just uh, say on behalf of the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial, I've been president of the memorial for a little while now, and uh, actually I spoke there for the first time in, in 1995 when Jim Schuster, one of the founders, asked me to speak. And ever since that time, I've called it the hill that heals because it was just a little hill, but uh, it was a place where I could go and uh, it was the first time I talked about Vietnam in 30 years. Uh, you wouldn't recognize me. I had a chopper, and uh, I married my sweetheart from Forest Hills Avenue. I lived on Cherry Avenue. I grew up there, graduated from Charles Lane High School, and uh, was drafted in the Marine Corps, went to Vietnam. We lost a lot of folks, and 28 of them memorialized there on that hill. Uh, some of them were UVA graduates because, you know, you lost your uh, as soon as you graduated from UVA, you lost your uh, deferment. But uh, I, I just want to right now just thank you for appointing the uh, working group. Uh, it was made up of uh, city staffers and three community uh, representatives and three uh, Vietnam veterans. Uh, it was a good working group. We met five times and uh, we had, uh, I think we had a lot of success. Uh, we got on the same page in some areas, not everywhere, but we end, all ended up wanting to pursue what City Council started in 2008, which was a pedestrian bridge called G1 Option. It was actually approved by City Council in 2008. It was a pedestrian bridge across the John Warner Parkway to the, connecting the trails that were going, it was a, a bike and 
and pet, pet bridge that was connecting the trails. Uh, that's the one we ended up with, and because of that, uh, we, we, the only thing we added to that was 35 parking spaces. We saw the hill over there where the lay down area and the parking was for the uh, construction of the John Warner Parkway. And of course, it was, uh, the road was, and entrance was already put in 750 feet down the way, so it, it didn't affect VDOT at all. And uh, it just seemed like a natural thing. And we asked the city to see how many parking places they could put there. They said 35. So it would serve, uh, it would be 430 feet, uh, excuse me, 340 feet uh, a ped, uh, ped and bike connector bridge that would uh, eliminate all the safety issues of crossing seven lanes of traffic, both for the folks, you know, probably the most beautiful and most underutilized trail in the system, if you ask Chris Jensik, uh, is the Meadow Creek Parkway Trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would provide parking right there adjacent to that trail. You could even put, uh, well, mm -hmm. that, am I done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. But you could finish your you thought. Thank okay. You. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Jim Schisler. Good evening. Good Madam evening. Mayor, Dr. Richardson, members of city council, Good evening. city staff, Mr. Brennan, if he's here. I'm Jim Schistler. I'm James D. Schistler, Jim Schistler. My residence is 901 Rugby Road. I am president emeritus of the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial Foundation, and we are the curators of the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial which was dedicated 20 April 1966, <clears throat> making it the nation's first public civic memorial honoring all Excuse those me, who Jesse. served in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Excuse me, could you just slide down I'm a sorry. bit to make sure that they can hear you at home? more particularly the 28 from the Charlottesville area and Alamo who gave their lives in that service. Thank you for the opportunity of the working group we had a congenial time. We discussed many, many methods of curing the access problem. And some were deemed ineffective. Some were deemed not workable. Some were deemed not cost efficient. Still others were not considered appropriate at all. Uh, we are seeking a solution for reasonable access to the memorial, a solution much better than the 13 minutes and 52 seconds it takes me to walk from the designated parking in the rescue squad lot to crossing the traffic and venturing up the non-compliant ADA hill path. After much, much work on the part of all the parties involved, the final report was prepared for presentation to you. We of the foundation feel that the report is a good reflection of our joint efforts. However, we of the foundation do feel that omissions were made and inclusions were made unbeknownst to us, and we feel, feel those need to be addressed later. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to accomplish the good and noble solution by providing convenient access to honor all our fallen hero heroes on a full-time, anytime, as desired, and as needed basis, and access to the hill at hill. Thank you. If I have time remaining, I would really give that to Mr. Levine. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jim Camblos. Council. Um, I'm Jim Kambloss. I've lived in Charlottesville Alvaro, all my life. Um, I got drafted in 1969. I spent 24 years active plus reserves. Proud of that service. Two of my friends are on that hill. Uh, 
you know all the history of the John Warner Parkway and the skate park and all the rest of it. I don't need to go over that again. What I want to emphasize to you is that hill is something that the city of Charlottesville should be very proud of. It's a beautiful site. It's one that's there for everybody. And when I say everybody, that includes people who are driving through town, who maybe they're dropping their child off at UVA or they're, they're, they're on the bypass for some reason and they're from out of town. They should be able, along with everybody in Charlottesville and Albemarle, they should be able to get to that hill and they can't do it now. Um, people drive around and around and around trying to figure out how to get up to that site. And I heard one story of a man who got so frustrated, he parked in the turn right lane, slammed the door, put his, put his blinking lights on, and walked up the path because he couldn't find a place to park. The pedestrian, the pedestrian bridge and the parking on the east side of uh, John Warner is a beautiful, beautiful way to solve the problem for everybody because if, if, if you agree to that and it's built, it's a 24-7, 365 access. There's no requirement for uh, shuttle buses or for anybody to, to take them up there. They can park there and walk across to the, um, to the site. And it's a gorgeous site, and everybody should be able to get to it, not just people who live in Charlottesville. But if you ask around, there are a lot of people in Charlottesville who don't know how to get to it. Mm -hmm. um, and this pedestrian bridge will, will solve that problem. And we thank you for your time. I know you've got a lot of very important things to deal with, but this one's very, very important to those mm -hmm. of us who served during that time period and the families of people who served during that time period. And um, thank you for your time. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Um, Peter Krebs. <coughs> Peter. Good evening. I'm Peter Krebs, Community Outreach Coordinator for the Piedmont Environmental Council. We're working with the city, the county, and the university to create a comprehensive network of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. This will have many environmental, economic, health, and social benefits, and is a fantastic return on investment. For now, however, there's much to be done before many residents will feel safe and comfortable walking and biking in their daily lives, often with good reason. On June 24th, local resident, uh, local native, uh, Robin Heitman, was struck by a vehicle while, uh, and killed while riding her bike in New York City. Robin's sister, Rachel, had a close call just two weeks later on Preston Avenue. Today, as we speak, their parents are in Richmond to observe the World Day of Remembrance for road traffic victims. They are there with Richmond Families for Safer Streets, Mayor LeVar Stoney, and many others to remember lost lives and to advocate policy changes such at the state level, such as distracted driving laws and the local pedestrian uh, and cyclist safety upgrades. There's also been a string of local casualties recently, including Charlottesville resident Bradley Dorman, who lost his life while trying to cross Route 29 in Albemarle County. At least two others were struck within just a few blocks of this building a few days after that, but I believe both of them survived. Thank goodness for that. Um, we do well to remember Robin, Bradley, and all the others. Uh, here tonight and always. I'll pause for just a second for that. Each situation is a unique tragedy, yet this room has heard many similar sounding stories about what happens when vehicles <coughs> and human lives collide. Each life is precious. <coughs> Be careful out there. Remember to cherish each other and every moment we share together. We also know that the streets don't have to be as deadly as they are. We must do all we can to assure that people can move about safely, however they choose to travel. That speaks to policy, and we'll get into some policy later this evening. 
but it also requires robust investment and infrastructure in complete streets and paths that are separated and protected from cars so people can walk and move about on bikes free from fear and risk of undue harm. This work is ongoing and I hope to see increasing commitments from both the city, county, and University of Virginia going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Myra Anderson. Good evening. Good evening. So I originally was going to um, speak on human rights, but I'm going to um, delay that because I'm waiting um, to get some additional information um, on my concern. But since I was already signed up um, to speak, I wanted to um, share a letter to the editor that I wrote this week um, on Friday, and it um, really just um, speaks to um, the stigma that is associated with mental illness. As you know, I'm a mental health advocate, um, and I only became a mental health advocate just based on my own experience into, in the mental health system. And um, seeing some of um, the disparities and some of the uh, discrimination and stigma in places um, that need improvement. So here is um, the letter that appeared in Daily Progress on Friday. A recent candidate for Charlottesville City Council had been arrested in order to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. There were many insensitive comments made across social media platforms regarding the situation. Some even made jokes. This is deeply disturbing to me. Experiencing a mental health breakdown or living with a mental illness is no joking matter. All I could feel was empathy. Maybe it's because I know firsthand what it feels like, or perhaps I have a great understanding of what it means to have compassion. Stigma and misconceptions are pervasive in our society when it comes to mental health and mental illness. When a mentally ill person becomes the brunt of jokes, it opens up a platform for more insensitivity. I've never once heard a joke about someone living with cancer or a heart condition, why don't we have that same level of compassion for mental illness? The mentally ill are often mocked, misunderstood, stigmatized, mistreated, misjudged, and we as a community either make jokes or go silent. The jokes or silence both continue to perpetuate a cycle of even more stigma and an even greater level of sensitivity to those who are suffering. Mental health affects the whole community on a micro and a macro level. And we often fail to see the intersectionality with other social issues. If we truly want to make our community a safe, vibrant, embracing place for all people, no matter their struggle, we must do better. Enough with the jokes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Tom Vandiver. Uh, Mayor Walker, I'm scheduled to be part of the presentation. Mm -hmm. And if it's OK with you, I'd like to yield my time to Jay Levine, who's one of, a member of the working group as okay. well. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of council and uh, city staff, uh, I'm Jay Levine, a uh, resident of Charlottesville for 50 years this trip after being an undergraduate in the uh, 50s. I am a veteran of the United States Navy, of which I'm quite proud. At UVA, uh, I, uh, my title was Associate Vice President for the Health System, but what I really did was solve large, complex problems. And uh, I was responsible for the design and construction of what was then the new hospital. Now it's the old hospital. And we've got a new gray building that's mm -hmm. the new hospital. Mm -hmm. But when we opened that building in 1989, it was somewhat amazing that we were able to satisfy 500 plus physicians, thousands of staff, and make everyone feel a part of it and have the facilities that they needed. And I'm very pleased with that. But the real answer there is the process. We've gone through uh, a process here. I've been asked to help as a community member 
to help with the, uh, the group that was working on the problem. Again, just to be absolutely precise, the problem is access to and parking for the Vietnam Memorial that's located in McIntyre Park. We, it's the lack of access and the lack of parking that's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, in solving any problem, and this one is complex because there are pros, cons, implications, and so on, but in solving any problem, as I think you all know, is first to define it. And it has been defined very clearly. The best way to make you understand the problem in greater definition is to ask you to go to the Vietnam Memorial. Go and park at the Charlottesville Amal Rescue Squad, cross the seven lanes of high-speed traffic, cross John Warner Parkway, and climb up the asphalt path uh, up there, and time yourself, and then come back down. And then think about doing that if you were not as mobile as you are and as healthy as you are, if you were a Vietnam vet and uh, were somewhat uh, debilitated, or if you were in a wheelchair, it's impossible. It's not just difficult. You know, in, in World War II, the Seabees, the, the Navy builders, used to say, um, if it's very, very difficult, consider it done. If it's impossible, it'll take just a bit longer. Uh, a little bit longer won't work here. You cannot get there from here if, if you're not fully capable. So we've defined the problem. As a working group, we have uh, worked to identify the possible solutions, which is the next step in a large complex problem. We have evaluated all of the options and possibilities, and we as a working group with city staff have selected the optimal option. It is not the least expensive, but it is clearly the best and has the best payoff to solve the problem. Uh, and then start down the path of using that information and solving uh, the problem. What we need from you is to understand the problem, we hope you will, and then to do what is necessary to help us implement it with an amendment or whatever the appropriate things are. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Um, Mary Carey. All right, Julian Talaferro. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the Council, Dr. Richardson. Uh, I think you've heard what our problem is and uh, one of the things we need, we do need access. We need to be able to get up there. And I'm speaking from my perspective as a, as a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I've been a resident of the city for over 50 years, live on Grove Road. Uh, I was drafted out of the fire department in 1966. I really didn't want to go, like a lot of people that went and didn't want to go. It was an unpopular war and all those things. But I think all my brothers in arms, we, we owe them something. And uh, people want to have access to this. And I think otherwise, it's really doing a disservice to a lot of our veterans. And, you know, I don't dwell on Vietnam, but there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about it, just a fleeting thought or something. And, you know, I had a lot of experiences over there. Most of them weren't the best. Uh, but one of the things that has stuck with me is the first night I arrived in country in Vietnam. And I was 27 years old at the time, and most of the people with me were 18, 19 year old kids. They were scared. I was too. Uh, but I always remember one thing that happened. They take you to a reception station and the next day or two you're going to go somewhere. Nobody knows where they're going to go. And, you know, people are thinking, well, will I ever get home and all those sorts of things that go through your mind. But the thing that sticks with me, and I think about it a lot, I went downstairs in this place where we were being billeted that night, and I went back upstairs and there were kids up there sitting around on their beds, literally crying. And it's kind of like, you know, what do you say to these people? Kids reading the Bible, and 
it sticks with me to this day. And uh, I just hope that you'll work with us and try to get us access. Uh, and I thank you for giving us the, the opportunity to appear before you. And I certainly hope that we can come to some resolution. Because I think, we, it, I know it mean a lot to me personally, and it'll mean a lot to all the Vietnam veterans. And uh, with that, I'll conclude. And once again, thank you all. Thank you. Tanisha Hudson. Good evening, Mayor, members of council, and Dr. Richardson. Good evening. Uh, first off, thank you all for putting the baby changing station in the bathroom. I'm really here to say thank you for that. Um, that was a good deal. Uh, Brian and I had a conversation about this earlier, but Brian, this is for the People's Coalition. They want to know when the report is to be finalized because they were told July and they haven't received anything. So I don't know if you want to answer that maybe after I speak um, or not so that they know because they're not here. I'm representing for them tonight. Um, and also what report the um, the DMC report. No. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Um, and also, just to follow up on these gentlemen that are here for the Vietnam Memorial, they do need parking. Uh, not only is it an issue for them to walk from uh, the rescue squad place where they're due to park now, but the light exchange there is like way off. So I don't know if y'all ride through there at like four or five o'clock, but the lights are totally off to the point that traffic is backed up. When the light by Seville Coffee is red, it should be green because the other lights to come from the parkway are green and it's red mm -hmm. and it's stopping the traffic. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine if these gentlemen want to go over there and pay respects at a certain time, the, the light coordination is off. So I, I'm not understanding why you possibly can't like create some parking from like the Charlottesville High School side of Melbourne, I believe. Because they shouldn't have to walk that far, right? At all. Um, <laughs> but anyway, thank y'all for the baby changing stations. I hope y'all can get them some parking. And Brian, can you address for the people? Can he address that? We'll have, yeah. we'll have it addressed. You, you ready? Since I still have time. Okay. Um, Dr. Richardson, if, if it's your pleasure, um, Kaki Dimmick has shared with uh, some in response to questions about the disproportionate minority contact uh, report that's currently in a draft and um, has been requested via FOIA, so that has been uh, shared with some in the community. Uh, my understanding is that um, there'll be a public meeting at which they'll formally accept the report in early December and they're looking to get that on the schedule of city council and the board of supervisors to find a time uh, when that can happen. Okay. That's the only update I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Um, William Atwood. Well, while Mr. Edwards coming up, we want to give a shout out to the Boy Scouts. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for coming. Appreciate y'all. You're not a tie, tie, not Mr. Dr. Edwards. You ain't learned that. Hi. Oh, much Mr. Sigourney. <laughs> uh, my name is William Atwood. I'm an architect in town. Been an architect for 40 years here, planner. I rise Good tonight evening. to speak uh, against the application of 209 Maury. Um, I see it as classic spot zoning without a comprehensive zoning plan in place. We've needed one for years. And as I recall, the only time I've spoke about this to you all who asked that particular developer to provide a site plan. And we have a sketch. It doesn't have any, any dimensions on it. We do not have a site plan. Uh, this neighborhood is one of the oldest, most established neighborhoods in town. It's enormous. It's got a great housing base. And it's been like this for 50 years. Uh, so this kind of a change uh, has to be made I feel a relationship of our view of all zoning, particularly given the fact, as I said, R2 zoning is mistakenly like a walk 
to the Omni, R3 is like a walk to Chicago. It is a huge change. And we need an interim zoning before we continue. And I wouldn't allow someone to jump a, a, a zoning category. It's one is residential, the other is 80 units an acre. I was a steward of this project for five years, some of you know. We had five or six applications for apartments, and they were all 80 units a, a, an acre, which is too easily accessible after this is done. Uh, the proffers uh, seem somewhat hollow because they respond to something that isn't real, which is a real engineered site plan. I mean, if you have a proffer, it's got to it's got to reflect a hard site plan. Otherwise, no dimensions. It's not real. Good example: the egress ingress on on the stadium is an impossible adjustment given what's going on in the stadium. Uh, if you don't know, back way off of Fontaine cuts the stadium, and that that. That particular intersection four-way is loaded to the hills in the morning and in the afternoon. Uh, we, we feel that uh, committing to a huge change instead of waiting for the professionals to create a reevaluation of the zoning is, is a mistake. Um, we, we see this. We know this neighborhood well. I've been there five years, lived there a year. This is a University of Virginia classic apartment building. I think that the ongoing uh, worries demonstrated by the, uh, the applicant that the neighbors in Fry Springs and uh, worried about, uh, uh, about the onslaught of University of Virginia students in their neighborhood is totally hollow. They've never appeared here and said anything about that. It's a little known fact, a well known fact, that I support the restoration of the house in a proper placement, and these buildings are huge. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Um, Jennifer Sessions. <laughs> Hi, Madam Mayor, members of council, and city staff. Um, I'm a new Charlottesvillian compared to some of the previous speakers. I hope that doesn't undercut my um, my concerns, um, I come in, in some ways following up on what the earlier speaker said in regards to pedestrian and bicycle safety, um, and I share every single one of the concerns that he mentioned. Um, but I want to put this in the context of the proposal that's coming up as agenda number eight regarding the e-scooter program. Um, I'm a pedestrian, a cyclist, and a rider of public transport. I get around the city several miles a day on foot, on, bi on my bicycle, and by, on the bus. Um, I have not once, since they appeared, in my travels managed to go from point A to point B without seeing one of the following. A scooter riding on a sidewalk, riding the wrong way in a bike lane, parked in a travel lane, a driveway, in front of a fire hydrant, in a walkway, in a uh, curb cut, in front of a pedestrian call button, in front of a bus stop, at a building entrance, or in an ADA ramp. Um, <coughs> all of the places that are mentioned in the current proposed policy as the things that scooter riders should avoid. They do not avoid them. Um, that suggests that the current system is simply inadequate. Secondly, a system that requires that any violation of the recommendations be reported by those pedestrians or those cyclists whose mobility and safety is impeded by the scooters, that it makes it the responsibility of those people and of the citizens of Charlottesville rather than the for-profit companies that own these scooters or the users of the scooters to police themselves is simply unacceptable. The, if the companies cannot find a way to control their own users and their own machines, they simply should not be allowed to operate in the city limits. Um, I would also say thank you for the promise to remove the Lewis and Clark Memorial. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have some additional spaces if there's anyone else who would like to um, speak. I think the young lady, sir, sir, I think the young lady was first. And did he already, he already spoke? Okay, yeah. 
So it would have to be someone different if you already spoke. Mm -hmm. um, so I initially was not really planning on speaking. Oh, what's your name? Rachel Heidman. Rachel. Yeah. I was not initially planning at speaking at this meeting. I um, am a representative for student council at the university, um, and we like to come to the meeting so that we can keep our community involved and engaged. But after the words of our, the man from the Peabot Environmental Council, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of what he said. Um, our streets are not safe, and if we want to have a city that promotes bike safety and the health of its, um, its citizens and it, to be welcoming, we need to have safer streets. I've been hit by cars twice this year and my sister died in New York City. I cycle everywhere. I cycled here from the university from my class, um, which I got out around 5.50 p.m. I, there was less than a mile of bike lanes between the central grounds of the university and here, and that was only on Main Street. Um, and then I think also kind of following what um, Jennifer has said, the e-scooters also present a significant issue and challenge alongside bike infrastructure. If we want to be able to implement e-scooters to promote um, a more healthy and environmentally friendly city, we need to first build that infrastructure and we need to make sure that the users are regulated. As a university student, I am probably one of the minority who absolutely hate the scooters. I think that they are completely misused and I think that um, they present dangers not only to cyclists but other pedestrians and to motorists. Um, and I think that if we want to maintain that program, that they need to be reevaluated and how they're used and how users are regulated. Um, I think that's that's all I have. To say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else who would like to speak that hasn't been up? No. It's a good night. All right. So we're going to close um, public comment. All right, so we should be able to get into the next first report. Mayor Walker, right. can I just say something, uh -huh. just briefly? Um, first off, I just, uh, with all the veterans in the room, I, I just definitely want to thank you, thank you for your service. And there's some pretty moving statements made tonight of, of sacrifice. And so thank you for what you've done for for us. And, and Ms. Heitman, uh, I am very sorry for your loss. Very sorry. Thank you for having the courage to come up and, and talk about it. Okay. All right, so next we have the um, Dogwood Vietnam Veterans Memorial Alternatives Report. So we created a little slideshow so y'all could turn around and watch. Um, these are the pictures from the presentation. That way everyone can follow along as we talk about things. Okay, so I'm Jeanette Yonichek. I'm UCI Program Manager for the City of Charlottesville. I was the project manager for the Interchange Project. So one of the first pictures you're going to see was the uh, memorial before the Interchange Project. So you would see a memorial on top of a hill. It had a wooden um, sign. Oh, it's coming on the monitor. It's, it's literally coming up. 
Okay, great. Um, so if you look at the monitors here, you would see the memorial. It's on top of the hill. There's a wooden sign declaring it as such. There was a memorial drive sign as well. Um, 250s to the left. The memorial is straight up um, on the right in this picture. So if you go to the next picture, there's a close-up of the sign and the flagpole and the flagpole with the um, granite slabs. So the granite slabs have the name of the um, individuals that are memorialized and it's surrounded by cobblestones. This was before the project happened. There wasn't any pedestrian walkway or driveway, et cetera, <coughs> in the park. Um, when the interchange project came along, you can go to the next page. This is what we worked with, um, particularly the Dogwood Vietnam Memorial Committee. We also reached out to the American Legion Post 74 and veterans of foreign wars. This is what we worked out where we could keep the memorial on the same site. We reoriented 180 degrees. We're able to add a concrete plaza. We had a little podium attached. We did um, stone facing of the parapet wall and a seat wall. We added a POW flag. We added a dedication stone. But most importantly, um, the next slide will show you the end result. We were able to add pedestrian access. We were able to add with the interchange the uh, pedestrian intersections across the ramps, um, taking you under 250 so you don't have to cross 250. That finally got us a pedestrian connection um, across 250, which we never had one before. Um, very dangerous intersection. And with that, we also were able to do some trailhead parking on south of 250, and that was to serve the park, serve the memorial, but also serve the car's um, foundation um, when they're doing training. They needed additional parking. They used to park at the old um, tennis courts. Um, when we were working on this, the primary focus was keeping it at the same location. This has been recognized as probably the first memorial to the Vietnam. It was actually um, established during the conflict. And we also were concerned about visibility. It was always visible from 250. When we raised 250, we had to raise the memorial 12 feet so that you could still see it. Otherwise, it would be about um, middle of the ramp as you're coming up, but in the same location. We also talked about access. We knew we were raising it up. We knew that was going to cause issues because you have to go further up the hill. So our plan was to do a 5% grade um, shared use path, only have it to one switch back. It is a distance. This is how long it needs to be in order to get up to that height, is long and short of it. Um, so the interchange was completed in July 2015. Um, immediately following that, we had a McIntyre Park master plan that started in 2014, also finished in 2015. This is it. Um, so you'll see the memorial in the bottom right. And you see that there are certain things that have been planned and have now been constructed. So we closed the entrance, the old entrance off 250. We made that emergency access only. We um, have built the skate park in the left corner there. And we've also built the pedestrian bridge at this point. So let's see. So then we were approached in 2019, and the focus was largely from the veterans is about access. And what we heard was it was too far to walk from the car's parking lot, so it's about a quarter of a mile. It requires crossing seven lanes at three signalized intersections, two ramps, and then John Warner Parkway. And the grade of the path is too steep. Um, for special events, we've agreed to, or parks had previously agreed to open up the emergency access and allow everyone to drive through the park as they normally did, park at the memorial. That's for three times a year. I'm sure if they added a fourth event, <coughs> parks would work with them to um, open that up as well um, for maintenance activities as well. So what we're looking at is really day-to-day -day visitors to the memorials, what we're looking for access from. Um, so I've mentioned a few of the issues of um, the skate park makes it a little bit more difficult to get access. The ped bridge is blocking us in a little bit more. We've also built a path with the um, 
uh, master plan where it goes um, in front of the memorial and it connects to the pedestrian bridge as well. We're dealing with a lot of topography. Um, basically, it's just a giant hill. Um, and both of the roadways which border it are limited access, but they're also depressed. So trying to get um, connections and access to the memorial from either of those has been um, a tough constraint. So Brennan's going to go over all the different things that we looked at trying to fix this problem. Um, can, one yes. quick question. Can you show me the emergency access point? Um, it's where the old waiting pool was. So it's on John Warner Parkway on the left side. Mm -hmm. And you used to drive in, and that used to be the golf course mm -hmm. parking lot and then the waiting pool parking lot. Mm -hmm. And that has remained the same. It's just now been fenced off and is kind of part of the skate park. What's the capacity of that parking area? When you that, do open it? It's still an asphalt lot. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Yeah. 35? 40? There's, there's no striped parking there. It's just asphalt at this point. Um, and the veterans don't really use the parking lot as much as they do. They, they take access, and then there's kind of a... I'll call it a two-track, but it's not really a two-track, where they go up on top of the hill and actually park up in the grass behind, correct? I guess not. Um, uh, but, but they do use that to, to get in there and, and access it. So, um, Yes. But we, but we could. Was that option? I don't remember. So, reading so I'll, I'll get into. Okay. Yeah, I'll get into that. Um, so again, Brennan Duncan, Sea Traffic Engineer. Um, thanks for having us. I, I would like to thank all of the the members of the um, the the working group. Um, we, as was stated earlier, we've had you know five meetings on this, um, and, and worked through a lot of things. We also um, as well had a, kind of a guest. Guest appearance from VDOT, uh, Joel Denunzio, who's one of the resident engineers, came and, um, and weighed in as well. So we had identified there, there was 22 total options that the, the group had kind of gone through and weighed. Um, several of them were short term, mid term, and long term. Um, we've addressed the majority of the short term ones that we, we could. Um, and I'll get into, I guess, the, the bulk of the report here. Um, the the remaining, I guess, short term options go to you know the the access up up the path. Um, it was constructed at five percent, um, which meets the ADA criteria for a path going up. But since it's it's been constructed, um, just due to the nature of freeze thaw, whatever else, there are certain sections that have heaved slightly. So um, there, we, we went in and measured every 20 feet, and so we found that a couple of those 20-foot sections are at 5.1 to 5.5%, which, to put in perspective, over that 20-foot section is between a quarter of an inch and one inch. So over 20 feet, that's the difference between 5 and 5.5%. Um, so with the working group, um, Again, we the city could have gone in and to to meet ADA to just flatten those out, but um, the working group kind of agreed that the best solution would be to add a few landing spots in that area, um, so two on each of the legs going up um, before two before the switchback and two after the switchback. Um, but we would have to find funding in order to do that. Um, it would cost. Approximately 125 to 150 thousand dollars in order to do that. Um, whereas if we were to just redo the asphalt grade back to five percent, we're talking 20-ish thousand dollars. Um, the midterm solutions, there were none that were readily um, acceptable to the group. Um, I guess the two that I'll bring up, um, one was utilizing a golf an ADA golf cart um, but that did not serve the purpose for the veterans as far as having you know being able to just go and visit the memorial like they, they would have to call make a reservation but that could be implemented for roughly twenty thousand um, dollars the the other one is 
is I'll call it phase one um, of the ultimate plan, but it would be to um, create a smaller parking lot over, and if you want to fast forward here a little bit, we can get to them. Um, so back, yep, sorry, two. So yeah, so it would be creating a small parking lot. It wouldn't necessarily have to be this full 35 space in the interim, but create a spot and create a sidewalk, and I guess you can go forward to that other one. Um, keep going. Keep going. Um, creating a, a small parking lot to the north that would connect via a sidewalk. Um, this would eliminate all the crossings of the ramps, but you would still have to cross John Warner Parkway. Um, so that, I guess, brings us to the ultimate solution that the, the group landed on, um, which is doing a bridge in a parking lot over John Warner Parkway. This was really the only viable solution um, that would meet safety requirements. And Madam Mayor, to your, to your point about the, um, the access of the waiting pool, um, both Vida and myself like, had assessed that and due to the the merging traffic um, and the speed of John Warner Park that 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 pool and that access point was available long before the the interchange kind of came together um, and because of the the merging traffic the acceleration um, both Vita and myself it, it's really not a safe spot to to come back you, you, you've got people that are either slowing down or speeding up there and to try and add another conflict point um, just w wasn't really viable. Um, you can kind of see the two lines in here, the pink and the yellow, were two options that were talked about as far as access um, off of either the ramp or 250 and then back out to John Warner Parkway. And really, we, it, it just wasn't really a feasible option um, to do that. So again, back to go. go I thought there was some restrictions around what we could and couldn't do to, in terms of access of off of John Warner Parkway. It yeah, it is it is. <coughs> excuse me. Um, it is limited access. Uh, we did talk to Beat out about it. It's okay. not something that's insurmountable. Okay. Um, and and even with our final option, there is going to be access to that parking lot off of John Warner Parkway. Um, so. You want to jump ahead one? So yeah, so like I was saying, like th this is kind of the interim solution of um, you know building a parking lot and having a drive off of what used to be the construction entrance for when we were doing it. Um, go one more. Um, so this would be, call it the short bridge um, option of 115 feet. This would essentially get you from the parking lot to the switchback and you'd still have 250 feet of, of climb, you know, from there up. Um, the next option that was presented was a, a bridge, you know, all the way over. Um, I'll just say that the longer the bridge, the it's not just you know linear, linearly more expensive. It gets kind of exponentially more expensive the longer the bridge gets. Um, so we did not cost this one. The cost that was in council's report was just for the short bridge um, option. Um, but with, with all that um, being said, these were kind of the, the findings that you know, we had. Um, it's really, again, because of all the other improvements that have been done and the planning that's been done over the years, um, we've kind of boxed ourselves in the corner. If, if we want 24-7, 365 access to the Vietnam Memorial, this is really the only viable way to do that. Um, Otherwise, you have to live with one of the options of a parking lot and walking across traffic. Those, you know, there, there's really because of the topography, because of the, their, you know, desire to leave the memorial where it is and not move it, and all of those, you know, factors come into play. It, you know, this is really the only thing that would, you know, service that that need. I do yeah. have a question. So on the short bridge, and there. There is no problem with the slope of the bridge. You've got enough length to comply with ADA and, so, and gradient. So the, the, 
the parking lot on the east side would actually be, if, if you haven't driven by there, there's kind of a knoll up there. Oh, yeah. Um, so there's already some vertical okay. rise there. Right. So the bridge itself would be, you know, at that, you know, 2 3%. Okay. Right. Grade. So okay. we would, more than likely, there would have to be a switch, a small switchback on the parking lot side, just, you know, like you would have for, you know, any kind of, um, access to a building to raise up three or four feet, like just a small switchback, six feet is what Jeanette's telling me. Um, What's the clearance requirement there? So we would probably be going for 17 feet to the, excuse me, <coughs> 17 feet to the bottom of the bridge. Um, the minimum we could go would be 15. Um, what, what is the next bridge at? What is the 250 bypass height? That's 17 and yeah, a half feet. Right. Just don't want to ever create another corner situation. Right. Yeah. No. We're we're not wanting to do that either. Um, so that's why you know my, my recommendation again would be to go with the 17, 17 and a half feet. Um, but again, that would we we would be able to get over the bridge. You'd have the access. Um, the only thing I'll say too then is if that's your parking, you know now you've got to get another switch back or something back down um, if you're trying to access the trail on you know the the east side of so this would get you access to the, the memorial but then you'd have another switch back or sidewalk or something you know trying to get back down to the trail if you didn't want to um, again go across to the west and then go down and then access back to the east across the intersection um, but I wanted to give uh, the veterans uh, a chance I just to, have a quick question sure. about um, traffic concerns on the turn into the on the parkway yeah so the we have it far enough up both both Vita and I looked at that it, it meets the access management guidelines for distance from an intersection um, you know we're showing uh, acceleration and deceleration lane there right now um, to you know allow people to kind of get off and people to go by them if that makes sense so you would turn that one lane into like it would be. So there would just there would just be a taper oh. over it on the you know to to get into the um, into the driveway. And you could access it coming north or south. Yes. So the okay. currently that is past the the end of the median. So if you were coming south, you would be able to turn just left cross. into there. And I'm this is probably a dumb question, but I. So this was it was raised 12 feet, and that's one of the things that caused all this. Right. Is that there's no way instead of the option of of moving it, which is noted, there's no way to lower it because there's concrete. I so mean, you'd have to we you'd basically demolish the memorial that we mm -hmm. built, lower it, and then rebuild it. But I mean, because that wouldn't. I'm just curious because it's a sensitive historical location for lots of reasons. But could it is would that be a possible? Solution. So if it were lowered, and then you'd be able to, and I'd be very curious what what the veterans would would say. Yeah, about that that, that wasn't an option that we had discussed. So I don't want to put them on the spot. No, I don't you mean. Don't but it, me to address that, I will. <laughs> uh, one of our members, Greg Kucinich. Y'all know Greg. He worked with Greg. Uh, he was the VDOT engineer doing the project. Kucinich. Yes. Uh, Greg showed me the plans uh, from the original plans for the. Uh, it's a it's a myth that the the Vietnam Memorial was raised. the the flag The flag itself was at 415, uh -huh. and the flag now the plaza is at 416. Okay. And I have told them this at five meetings, and they have not done the research to find out. And uh, they need to go back and look at the original plans. Now we're talking about the flagpole. You can look back at the picture. Look at the picture that they showed you. The first picture. You can see it's at the top of the hill. It hasn't been raised a, a bit. Okay. And I, I was on the master plan committee. I was worked with Jeanette on this thing. And, uh, you know, I really feel like this is such a win for the whole community. It's, uh, it's a win, win, win. We have worked with the Parks and Rec, and we've donated over $50,000 to that memorial. And uh, we continue to do it. We put the sod down. We planted uh, $14,000 worth of dogwood trees up there. And uh, the city has graciously taken over, taken care of that. We buy, the, we buy them the fertilizer and seed. They reseed it and fertilize it every year. The Parks and Rec have done a phenomenal job of 
taken ownership of that memorial. And uh, I'm not sure who's taken over for Brian Daly, but uh, we look forward to working with Parks and Rec. In the future, you have an asset here. The veterans want to make this a world-class city, you know? We want to help you do that. The only way you can do that is if you can access that park and the trails. Those people that are taking the trails across the park have to go down and cross the lanes of traffic to get to the other, other trail. We're offering you a way to have access across there, a bike, a ped, bridge. Won't be near as expensive as a couple you've built recently. And it, it's such a win, win, win for Parks and Rec, for the city of Charlottesville, and please let us veterans help you do it. That's all I ask. Thank you. Thank you. and council, uh, I, would, I'm, I was also a member of the working group. Um, and I would like, like to start, even though the report says no uh, action needed, I, I think there is action needed. Uh, the first thing I would like to point out is the existing access does not comply with federal law. It hasn't complied for seven years. The city has been out of compliance for seven years. During that period of time, the city has twice, when I was on council back in the 90s, we looked at the master plan. Uh, this part of the park was designated as passive act, act, activity. However, once the parkway was approved, the existing state skate park was relocated to the waiting pool area and basically abandoning the passive use concept. In that period of time, over $4 million has been spent relocating and rebuilding the skate park and a very elaborate pedestrian bridge across the railroad only this year, the city put in a new parking lot, a 24-space parking lot adjacent to the railroad to allow what is now, if you want to go to the skate park, it's a 500-foot walk from the parking. However, our folks who want to visit, anyone who wants to visit the eastern edge of the park and see the memorial, has to travel a quarter mile and cross all this traffic. Uh, that's why, even though the pedestrian bridge is getting short shift in, in the presentation, we really feel like it is a, a major asset to the community. It reinstitutes a plan that was already there in 2008 as the John Walker, uh, John uh, Warner Parkway was being uh, planned. Um, the reason for it being removed is, is still unclear. Um, but this access point would also uh, assist people visiting other amenities like the proposed botanical gardens. Um, but what I want to say to you is, in the original draft of this report, improvements to the existing asphalt trail were labeled immediate solutions. It's been changed in your report to say short term. I would say it's already been seven years. You are in jeopardy as a city. You are also in jeopardy because the city maintains what I think is a myth by calling this trail a, a trail under ADA. It doesn't satisfy this, the requirements for a trail. It's a very sloppy attempt at what I think is an oversight. You fire, oh, we forgot. There's the memorial. Let's do something. Oh, we'll slop down this asphalt trail. But we do have the opportunity to, to address that. And the reason I think you need immediate action 
is to at least show some good faith and say, well, we're at least going to get this thing to 5%, even though it's probably not a trail. Maybe that'll buy us some time. And we can show our good faith by approving this project, perhaps giving it a location on the <coughs> CIP. That would allow, there, there are, for example, there's TAP money from um, VDOT that would be eligible for this project. Right now, yet to, next year, the city will begin a six-year plan, the multimodal improvements plan, $974 million. If your staff is creative and aggressive, much of this work could be folded into that. Um, uh, and I would ask you to press the staff to look creatively and not just say, no, it can't be done. Um, be, um, beyond that, um, I would say that the project also offers you a number of opportunities. One is it connects two arterial bicycle uh, routes and connects them throughout the park, throughout the city in this case. Um, it also um, eliminates several, I guess what VDOT would call conflict areas where pedestrians and vehicles come together. <laughs> um, and uh, we've already heard some of the problems with that. Um, I would also say this is not just for veterans, it's for everybody. Um, if you were at the Veterans Memorial ceremony on Monday, you would have seen that more than half of the people there were not veterans. They were concerned. They wanted to see this memorial. Uh, but I would encourage you to press the staff and say, find me some reprogrammed money. Let's fix this thing right now. Let's get it done, not wait. And, uh, and let's, if it's, if it's on the, the capital budget as a hook, then we can go after other money. We think there's private money out there that would help. But if the city hasn't endorsed it as a project, that's going to be nearly impossible. So that would be my encouragement Mr. to you. Ms. Mr. Vander. Yeah, Dave, Dave Norris, would you come speak to? Thanks. Mr. Vander. Mr. Vander. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. Yeah, we're, we're, you're saying that there are seven violations pertaining to 80 or seven years of violations from the ADA. Um, can you tell me how does that play into a, a awesome. memorial in terms of having <laughs> ADA compliance? Because I'm not too sure about that. Well, if your access point, let me tell you, let me mention one other thing. Um, <coughs> section 206.4 and 206.3 uh, of the ADA uh, require with new construction that 60% uh, of, um, of, of public interests, entrances be accessible. In this case, even calling this a trail, it did not meet the 5% slope. So for seven years, it's been sitting there out of compliance. Nobody noticed till recently, but it never was built properly. So. Can I say something? Go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say that we built it to 5%. We surveyed it from the bottom of the trail to the switchback, switchback to the top of the memorial. It's 5%. The veterans continued to say that it was out of compliance. So we then went and surveyed it in 20-foot increments. And it was at that point we found six 20-foot increments that were either 5.1% or 5.5%. So that's why we're proposing a $20,000 fix that could get us to the 5%. Staff's interpretation of ADA is that 5% or less must be attained to either be a trail or to be a pedestrian <laughs> circulation path in order to be ADA compliant? I would say that a complaint would argue <clears throat> that the city improperly applied the trail exemption to this situation. And during that same period, has instead 
chosen to spend $4 million rather than make this accessible. Um, I mean, truthfully, it's gonna, it would be decided by the courts. You can flip your coin and take your chances. But I would say to you also, do you really think that that is something that the city of Charlottesville should say, just shrug its head and say, well, it's, good, it's close enough, it's okay. We don't care about it, thanks. Um, uh, for me, it's not. It's, it's not, not what we should be doing. Anyway, let me get out of the way here for a day. Uh, Dave Norris, I was a member of the working group and um, more importantly, I'm a son of a Vietnam War veteran. And um, one thing I want to say is that I served on council at the time that the Meadow Creek Parkway, the John Warner Parkway, the, the plans were, were approved. Um, and we made a commitment at that time to the veterans and to visitors to the memorial that they would continue to have good access to the memorial as part of that parkway project. That was a commitment we made. And I've spoken with Julian Talaferro, who's here in the room tonight, um, and we both believe strongly that uh, council would not have approved a design for the parkway project that would have required uh, citizens, especially seniors and people in wheelchairs, to cross three very busy roads and uh, park a quarter of a mile away and try to navigate uh, these conditions to be able to access the memorial. And so we strongly urge you to uh, um, proceed with the solution that uh, the working group arrived at. Um, we do believe, as Mr. Vandiver said, that there are funds available uh, so that the, the cost won't fall entirely on the city. Um, we do ask that you consider uh, directing staff tonight to uh, explore including some money in this coming year's uh, uh, capital improvement program budget for at least for engineering and, uh, arch uh, and design on the pedestrian bridge in addition to the money for the trail improvements that have been discussed. The reality is that even if we get the trail down to 3%, even if we lower the memorial 12 feet, that doesn't address this other key issue, which is um, unsafe conditions getting to the trailhead, getting to the memorial as they are now. And it's really uh, unfortunate. I had the occasion to visit the memorial with a couple of veterans not too long ago. One of them uh, is in a wheelchair and did not feel, didn't even bother getting out of his car. He did not feel safe even trying to navigate three very busy roads in a wheelchair to visit uh, this very special location. So I think that's something we can all, hopefully something we can all commit to working on. Hi, um, I just had a question. Sure. What, what about what you feel was approved by a council at that time is different than where we ultimately ended up, just so I'm understanding Well, that. so at that time we still had the um, waiting pool and the parking lot next the to the waiting pool. The master plan hadn't been done yet? Correct. Okay. And so um, at the time, we did not envision that that parking lot would be taken away and that they would have to park all the way up by uh, cars and have to mm -hmm. cross three very busy roads to get to the trail. Thank you. What was communication during the master plan process? That was after my time on council. So okay. I can't speak to that. But I, I do, I, under, I understand Bruce uh, was on the master planning committee and you want to tell that story? You, you said there were a number of occasions where you, you brought up the need for to maintain access and you thought it was going to be in the final plan, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. Well, actually, actually, I was just a citizen on the on the committee. What, uh, I, I'll be very brief, but we met at uh, Charlottesville High School cafeteria, had 11 working groups, and came up with presentations for the master plan from the community. Uh, the, the big the big thing, of course, was the bio, uh, botanical garden, and all of us accepted that that would be in, in the plan. I think they wanted seven or eight acres at that time. They, uh, they also, uh, I guess, wanted to uh, ask about the golf course, if we wanted to keep the golf course. It was mm -hmm. utilized by the first tee program, 3,500. Underprivileged kids went through there every year. I learned to play golf there myself. But anyway, uh, eight of us, eight of our groups recommended taking that 65 acres and the three, uh, the three golf courses, uh, three holes that we were lost were going to be redone on the other side. Where, where are they going to put a pavilion now, I think? Uh, but anyway, uh, that, our eight things were not accepted. The one that was accepted, uh, it did still have, uh, and, and it was fine. It had a rich a rim trail, they called it, all the way around the park. Uh, a 10-foot wide asphalt 
and that's what it was designed for. Uh, it was uh, the, the, the uh, site work and the uh, erosion control was designed for that. That was the, and then the final site plan came out and was introduced to Jefferson School. We went, and, it, and we were quite surprised that they had removed a lot of that stuff. Uh, so our working group uh, efforts were, went unnoticed, I would say. Mm, thank thank you. you. St um, staff, are there any comments after? I, I mean, I'll just say again that staff disagrees with Mr. Van Dever's assessment that, you know, it, it's been out of, I mean, it, again, I, from all of all that we could tell, it was in compliance from the moment it was built, and asphalt does deform. I mean, it's, it's a flexible pavement. So we're talking about a quarter of an inch to an inch, it has moved over time and is no longer compliant from that standpoint that it doesn't meet the 5%. We can fix that. Um, you know, the fact that the, the code that he's referencing is in reference to buildings, not necessarily, uh, you know, a park and uh, something that is, you know, was intended to be recreational in nature um, like this. It's, it's not a facility, it's a park. Um, so, so again, staff does not believe that, you know, we're in violation from, from that standpoint of, of what he referenced. But other than that, um, you know, we, we would like direction from staff as, or sorry, direction from council as staff as to how you would like us to proceed. Um, do, would you like us to just do the, the repaving? Yeah. Do you want us to, you know, go after, in, you know, we'll, we'll need additional funds, whether we try and find that somewhere else in the budget or you, you find, you know, help us with that um, as far as you know doing additional landing spaces um, to, to put that in or do we want to move forward with some kind of midterm option of getting started on engineering um, <coughs> a parking lot sidewalk um, I'd like to we just need direction on what to do madam mayor mm -hmm. and dr. Richardson uh, this is gonna be kind of a procedural point um, but it would we in the past have had a lot of difficulty when items come up when they're not framed as ready for a motion, depending on whatever prep work happened before that, for council to make a, a crisp decision on. And this one, it could be a very unproductive use of our deliberative time up here to have to weigh eight different options and kind of openly debate them without a motion between all of them having been framed for us. Um, so I'm not sure what the purpose here will be for us five to do right now. Like I can sort of, I, th th this is like taking on the flavor of a work session. That's what I'm, I'm where, thinking. This is more like a work session. Which is fine. We, you know, we did previously have space for work sessions on Thursday nights or we had moved them into Tuesday nights. And I, I suggested Dr. Richardson, like, I, you know, I'm, I, I, speaking personally, I would be, I'm very interested in the idea of building a pedestrian bridge along the model of the other ones. We're doing the capital budget right now, but we've just heard about the botanical gardens also, which is a really big deal. So if this could be sort of synced up with that mm -hmm. other piece, which we do want to solve the infrastructure that would enable the, but we're doing a lot of other discussions about the capital budget right now too, and if there's other sources of funds, but I would want to know what the city manager, how you evaluated and yeah, that and amid all these. Well, let me just say this one thing is that uh, this came to you as a report to right. give you information update on it and where we're at uh, and how we're proceeding in terms of working uh, with the uh, veterans. Uh, what I would do, uh, because as you know, uh, our CIP right now, <laughs> we're at our limit in terms of, uh, you know, being able to fund in terms of our uh, projected revenues uh, going into fiscal year 2021. So what I would suggest is that we would go into a work session we would have further conversation about this and then decide, you know, is this, you know, and I'm not saying it's not a priority, but is it a priority to, uh, uh, um, to basically um, reduce or uh, basically eliminate other projects that are already in line uh, that uh, in terms of going into fiscal year 2021, 20, or do we continue to look at outer years to be able to do something uh, as was mentioned, uh, you know, about the trail, I mean, that could be something that we could look at in terms of a short term, but anything long term, I would put it in the capital. 
uh, because you talk about priorities, uh, you know, as I talked about before, you know, I still, uh, my understanding, and I'll correct me if I'm wrong, but always been a priority since I got here was housing and schools and looking at that. And then after that, being able to look at other things. But I know that, you know, when we talk about capital projects, when we talk about things that were done in the past, had they been given funding in the past and done things to a certain point, uh, I can answer that in the affirmative and say yes in terms of them having dollars giving to uh, the memorial at the park. Is it something you want to plan later on as it becomes more of a priority to be able to do that? Uh, we can do that. We can talk about that. But I think it would be more so a work session because this is just a report. And I think, and Madam Mayor, just one other just question would, would be if there are, as Mr. Vandemer said, if there are, because of the nature of this, if there would be potential different sources of funds, mm -hmm. that would be very relevant information to bring into. And if creative, the M, hold tight. Sorry. So, um, we have looked at different funding source. So smart scale, it has five different criteria. Right, I doubt it. It would scale. score incredibly low, right. and we don't recommend that. Revenue sharing is a possibility where the city would put up half of it and ask for the state to put up half of it. This is going to be a little interesting of an application because it's a parking lot and it is a pedestrian bridge that connects a parking lot to a memorial it's not a transportation corridor so can, we'll can have I ask to a question about mm -hmm. that um yes. it kind of kind of very quickly brushed over the idea of a switch back to connect to the bike trail but if it if it became very much more connected to <coughs> the multi-use trail Mm -hmm. it, went, it would very much become a, a bike head corridor mm -hmm. that would provide alternative routes for commuting. It would be alternative, but we'd also, revenue sharing, they don't really put any, um, we could put an application together, it's up to us to justify, they don't really get into that. It's more that it's 200, 300 feet away from a crossing where we've had no incidences that well, I guess signalized, I, yeah, et cetera. I, so maybe, and, and just yeah. so you know, that application deadline has been missed for okay. this year. It's for the next two years. So an application, the next available application would be two years from now. So, so how about the TAP funds? The TAP fund and enhancement grant, we, um, the district normally gets a million dollars, Culpepper. Um, they want a complete project. So we would be taking all the funding for the district um, the members at large at the CTP also get a million dollars that they can place on a project. So if this was written in such a way that garnered enough attention, that's a possibility. But I, I would again say that local funds are needed. There, and that's been missed too, that deadline. So I have um, just a couple comments. Um, I think the um, the questions I had around the access point, like wherever we are, you know, ho however long it takes us to have the working group um, make some decisions, however long it's on this ends up on the CIP plan, which I think we should place it on there, um, the um, unfunded list that we requested, just so we can know. And hopefully, you all are looking at the parks master plan, just knowing. I think it was maybe less than 600 people who participated in the survey responses for that. So just weighing out what has become a priority um, on that would be, you know, helpful information mm -hmm. as we explored the, um, you know, as we explored the, um, the potential funding for w whatever projects that are within that um, area. But the, the access that they have three times a year um, while we're deciding is there a way to explore what that may look like, um, opening that up to just more days. I mean, again, the, you, you run into the safety issues and which, which days are you, I mean, which days are you trying to open it up? I, mean, I don't we, know. I mean, I just yeah, think I mean, that's we, a conversation. Be, again, if there's another event or something like that that's going on, like we, we don't necessarily have an issue with opening it up, you know, for an event. It's much more the, the all day, every day, you know, access issues. Yeah, I understand with, that. With that. And it, in reality, if you, if you open that up, you're going to get the skateboarders that are pulling in there and parking 
24 7 <laughs> as opposed mm -hmm. to the people who probably want to visit the memorial because mm -hmm. you know, that place is always packed mm -hmm. i just think that may be a conversation that we can have to figure out while we're in this process just you know maybe there could be more than three days per year of access until we figure out um, the rest of it. Well, I think that's a discussion that we would have to have with the veterans <coughs> pertaining to that. They want to have more opportunities to be there other than the three days, right. maybe it's 10 days. Uh, you know, we could have <coughs> access uh, to uh, the memorial, so. Yeah. So is there that. Are there any uh, other questions? Or, I'm sorry. I'm no, but um, who will be responsible for having that conversation to even see if that's something? Yeah, we that staff can reach back out the, through the, okay. the working group to talk talk through that. And the immediate solutions, that is something also that we would explore in the work session as well. That's it, yeah. Okay. And wait a minute, in terms of what? I mean, be, be Just the possibility. I mean, yeah, the, there's, uh, the, uh, there's, there's really two immediate yeah. solutions. That, that, but two know, options. Two options. Yeah, correct. I'm looking at them right okay. now. Yeah. Um, I had them marked. But it sounds clear from just the feedback we've heard that that's really not addressing the main issue. The main no. issue is yeah. the main far issue more significant is than this and, adju and access. adjusted right. access. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The 5% the walkway is not the main issue right. um, for them. So. Okay. And, and Mayor Walker, just for the record, I mean, I, I was here when we had the approval of the East of the McIntyre uh, master plan approval. This did not come up then. Mm -hmm. It it didn't come up then. <coughs> so yeah, there were the discussions about whether or not there was going to be a golf course at the top of the hill, whether it was going to be passive or active space. Um, there was the conversation that slowly grew about the skate park coming in. We knew that the waiting pool was obsolete. It needed to be replaced. And I, I say this not in any way to minimize the intense importance of access to this beautiful, very big investment that we've made for the Vietnam Memorial, because it, it makes no sense to have this beautiful memorial and the people that it is giving tribute to cannot access it. So this is a, this is a, new this is a revelation right this is a, a new wrinkle to this story that we need to find a solution for and it does seem that there's a near term and that there's a long term solution i would say we do need to get this baked into the the capital budget it does need to be part of the broader conversation of of bike pad greenway corridor access because there could be more funds available in that regard but i i don't want anyone to leave tonight thinking that we're not taking this seriously. We have got to time it right. It, it is something that's grown up as a problem over time. And as our veterans have aged, access has changed in terms of how it needs to be dealt with. And so we need, and I just, we need to be sensitive about that. We need to be customer oriented about that. And also everyone, we need to be practical about it. We, this capital budget ain't got the, the room in it. Mm -hmm. for something this big mm -hmm. but maybe further a couple of few <coughs> years down the road it will and what can we do to make it as mayor walker saying what can we do right now that will start accommodating the needs sooner versus mm -hmm. later mm -hmm. but I, I i do think this is something that needs to get fixed permanently and it's got to get on our radar because it hadn't been before and and we it, it makes no sense to not be able to have access to that that beautiful mm -hmm. memorial but I'll say too that just hearing the comments about what the working group and the information that at some point um, it seems that um, they thought that the conversations they were have at least at the parks and rec level yeah, was going to make sure access was available. It didn't come up. So that's the importance of making sure that the reports that come out of those advisory <coughs> committees that um, we are able to look at those and see if, and I don't and, know if staff. And Brian Daly was on this committee before he, he resigned from the city. Um, mm -hmm. And he had stated that there was never any kind of written agreement that said that the access off the waiting pool would 
remain or you know there was there was never that promise made um, I know Dave spoke that that wasn't you know council's intent was there was going to be access yes. but it wasn't necessarily that it was always going to be in that spot mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately I think we we've, we've boxed ourselves in a corner mm -hmm. you know it it's, looks it's, like it's it. very mm -hmm. difficult to get access to it at this point yeah okay. all right thank you <coughs> So we're going to set up um, a work group to discuss this a little bit more in the future. Thank you. And one thing beyond the, the work group and work session, um, the immediate solution, council could ask for staff to to find the 20,000 to come back as an appropriation on a consent agenda, just the 20,000 for the 5% I was, I was um, actually in, in favor of such, I heard, until I actually heard uh, Councilor Signer express his interest or his mm -hmm. specifics in regards to how we don't um, like for things to be, to come kind of ad hoc and we like for them to be bundled up more. But I do think in the immediate, um, it's a way for us to be able to address this issue and provide some kind of uh, relief in the immediate just but i think what staff said about one 5.1 and 5.3 right. and 5.5 is that what i heard um i don't think that that it's would really difference it, it's going to be so slight i don't even think it's going to be um but I real think it, noticeable but if we do a work session relatively soon we, right. we can make this decision yes. if this is within the next and we can weigh these things it sound it it sounds to me like that's the band-aid that you all are probably looking for but 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 if it helps address a city problem or whatever but we, we can we can make all these decisions i think pretty i'm well just being enough. realistic when i think about us work adding session. another work session in yeah. terms of all of our schedules it's true right. and it's already mid-november so i mean realistically i mean all it's, three we, new council members are in the room they've heard the discussion and it's probably going to be a work <coughs> session probably you know the first quarter of next year versus with this council and I, welcome I, to the well, easy problems of <laughs> charlesville <laughs> city council <laughs> and i and i understand all points on the uh or maybe one on the dais but i mean we we got to start getting to the point where we do have work sessions instead of making you know decisions on yes uh, that's, what, we just on the, I, that's mm -hmm. what i'm just saying i'm saying <laughs> the same thing but i'm just i'm you. just <laughs> saying because we've done it up here mm -hmm. and i just want to make sure that we do Excellent. that and make sure that we have a chance to look at all the options instead of you know being able to just say fund it on the day as so we're going to take a vote tonight yes yeah. but i think in this work session would be helpful is to look at that master plan we just had um, a lot of interest in the botanical gardens mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that could be a conversation mm -hmm. that's a part mm -hmm. of this work session Very smart. Yep. also um so that we are able to look at this as holistically as possible and it'll be open so that we are not having those kind of discussions during the budget that's right. Yeah, I would say that there's a McIntyre East group, even a little slightly different, of more the passive part of the park. There's a lot of interested stakeholders in, in a lot of the master plan that's going on with the park. So, And Greenbrier, every budget cycle, those trails over there, that's been that's um, right. a lot of energy there. So it just may, if that's um, a possibility, so we may want to do it earlier than later to save us some of those conversations during the budget meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you all. Right. Thank you very much. The new council then. Yeah, I just wanted to be realistic about that. Okay, so we're going to take a 15 minute break. Ten? <laughs> we're not Can we do be 10? Back in 10. <laughs> Can I get, uh,